in Jesus' name, amen. Ladies and gentlemen, church members, visitors, boys and girls, we are starting on an epic journey today. It is about prophecies, it's about pandemics, and it's about peace. I am Piroshka Vranyak Nefet, one of the pastors uh, here at Nanawading Church. And uh, it is my privilege to start you out on this journey as we discover what God's message is to us in these times. A few weeks ago, I attended the Melbourne International Flower and Garden Show. Now, this was a highlight for me. Over the past few years, I always watched it on television, but living in WA didn't give me the opportunity to ever be there in person. So this year, it was a high day. I could go and actually be immersed and be inspired. It was an amazing experience to walk among the floral sculptures and amazing garden designs and show gardens. There were some inspirational elements mixed with the smell of the grass and an amazing perfume of the colorful blooms that imprinted in my memory for a long time. But during my walk along Carlton Gardens, I came across a rather interesting garden design, this one. And it attracted an unusually big crowd. And later on I found out that it was called the Climate Catastrophe Garden Design. Now it depicted a suburban weatherboard decaying house sinking haphazardly into a lake, surrounded by molds of blue stone. There was a neon sign on the top, not sure if you can see it, coming soon. But as I stepped back, I noticed there was a bigger sign right at the front that said 2.6 billion square meters. And it, it puzzled me. What do they mean, 2.6 billion square meters? When I got home, I checked up the facts. And Dr. Google did tell me that the number refers to the global rate of deforestation over a five-day period while this show was taking place. 2.6 billion square meter of forest would be cut down over five days. Now, I know we have to balance this number up out with forestation, but still the deforestation way outnumbers the forestation. If I want to bring that 2.6 billion square meter down to, to my level and to our level would be one football field of forest being cut down every second. One football field of forest. So as I was looking at this garden, it reminded me of the fact that we are living in rapidly changing and challenging times, wouldn't you agree? Even if you don't follow the news and the scientific papers closely, we all sense that all is not well in the world. Our natural world is struggling. Bushfires, floods, extinction of animal and and plant species, tsunamis, volcanic eruptions, plastic pollution, and the list just goes on and on and on. However, not only our natural environment is at risk and is subject to massive changes, so is our social, and on top of it, the economic and, and political environments are a tipping point. We are entering an era of global food shortages and food insecurities never experienced before. A number of third world countries are on the edge of humanitarian crisis and we are st still trying to figure out how to live with COVID-19. And as we are trying to 
come out of the valley of COVID-19, we are running at breakneck speed into another financial crisis. And the potential collapse of democratic forms, as we see some major nations who have completely different value systems clashing, it just creates a fertile gland for this political mess that we experience in our global village. When it comes to war, I know we focus on one, but did you know that as we speak, there are 40 active wars happening in our world? Add to it inflation, migration, and possibly many other things, and you can see why the outlook of the future is pretty grim. Our world, as somebody said on the radio yesterday, is spinning out of control. And the byproduct of this messy situation is that people are getting more and more worried because there is no future, there is no hope. It strips people of hope in a better world. And we all need hope. Without hope, human beings can't survive. It's one of our crucial uh, substances we need to have. We need assurance that it is going to be okay. But there is also something about human nature where we want to be in the know-how. We don't like secrets. We want to know it all, don't we? We are curious. I mean, and we hate to be left out. And Sad has found that in times of turmoil and in times of uncertainty, the number of conspiracy theories actually jumps. Perhaps you heard of the theories of how COVID-19 came by. There were some theories that, oh, it was caused by the 5G towers. Then there was another conspiracy theory that no, it was Bill Gates. He engineered the virus so that the global population would be decreased. Maybe you heard stories that the COVID data is deliberately inflated or that the government is actually trying to track us down through the COVID safe app and we could go on and on and on. But what makes these stories conspiracies is that they cannot be proven by clear evidence, cannot be falsified, but cannot be fully proven. Conspiracies are explanation of major events with a twist. As it said in a research article, powerful and malevolent actors are involved in secret plots for their own benefit to the determined, determined of the common good. And it goes on saying that they generally consist of complex storylines that are hidden from public scrutiny, thus making them especially resistant to falsification. In an essence, what the study is saying, that conspiracies are truth, facts of truth mixed with speculations that may not or may be right. Truth mixed with speculation. And what psychologists and sociologists found is that conspiracy theories serve a valuable purpose for individuals who have intolerances for uncertainties, who don't like hopelessness, who want peace, who want certainty. The study was finished with this People are more likely to endorse conspiracy theories when conditions of uncertainty and stress are salient. People are desperately looking for hope in this world. And given the messy and the destabilized environment we live in, it looks like that people are turning to conspiracy theories as a security blanket something to give them some sort of explanation and some sort of proof that it is going to be okay, that there can be things done to correct it. Now, for us as Christians, God is the one whom our hope and certainty lies. He is not only our creator, he is not only our sustainers, but he is the one in him our hope 
and our future centers. It says in the Bible, in Colossians, he existed before anything else, and he holds all creation together. But one could ask, how do you know if God is real? Can you prove him to me? Now, I might not be able to see God face to face, but I can see his fingerprints in my lives every single day. And there is no one who could convince me that God is not real because he is proving himself to me numerous times. I like how Jesus addressed it and said, you believe because you have seen me, but blessed are those who believe without seeing me. God knew, Jesus knew that after his departure, there has to be strong belief because there won't be face-to-face -face interaction. So he said, blessed are those who believe without seeing me. However, God's fingerprints can be discovered not only in our personal walk with God, but it can also be discovered on the pages of history that I personally find fascinating. You know, while God is somewhat distant from us because of our sinful human nature, he made sure that the Bible, his word, the prophecies contained in it are proof of his existence. After all, the Bible says all scripture is inspired by God. And the Bible contains various stories, some witness accounts, and communications from God. And those communications from God is what we call prophecies. And a vast majority of these prophecies have historical elements to it. By most of these prophecies concerning human history were written thousands of years ago. We can look back from our viewpoint and see that those prophecies have each one come true. There is evidence. Some are getting fulfilled as we speak. And that gives us confidence that the future ahead of us is going to happen what is written in the Bible. I would like to draw your attention to one point here, that prophecies are not given to predict the future. I would like to repeat it again. Prophecies are not given to predict the future. They are given to us to see where we are in a human history at a given time. They are like road marks. When you get there, you know where you are. But it's not for you to plan how it's going to unfold. Jesus said it this way. I have told you these things before, these prophecies, that they happen so that when they do happen, you will believe. It is not given, prophecies are not given for speculation. Prophecies are given to strengthen our faith as we see them fulfilled. They are helping us to gain confidence in God. And the result of this confidence is that we step out in faith and follow him. As someone said, prophecies are God's way of continuing his conversation with us since he left this earth. I love one of my go-to texts when we talk about prophecies found in 2 Peter, and I would love to share this with you. It says, we have also have the prophetic message as something completely reliable, and you will do well to pay attention to it, as to a light shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Above all, you must understand that no prophecy of scripture came about by the prophet's own interpretation of things. For prophecy never had its origin in the human will, but prophets, though human, spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. On that note, let me take you to a fascinating prophecy that is found in the book of 
Daniel. And this prophecy played a major part in turning my atheist mind to accept God when I was in my late teens. To me, this prophecy is a proof that we can serve an all-knowing God who does see the future. Now, a few days ago, as we were preparing for this worship service, I asked Daryl to take a children's story. And I told him, Daryl, talk about something to our children that, that proves that the Bible is right, that we can trust it. I never thought that Daryl would pick exactly the same prophecy as I was about to share. But you know, I see the Holy Spirit working through this. Because the story you shared, Daryl, now we can prove it from scripture that it is actually scriptural and see if what Daryl said is actually correct. Well, to set the stage to this prophecy, Daniel 2, let me take you back to the 6th century BC. This prophecy is recorded, as I said, in Daniel chapter 2. But before we start, I would like to introduce you to the main, two main characters of this prophecy. The first one is Daniel. What do we know about Daniel? We know, and Daryl, you were right, he lived about two and a half thousand uh, years ago. He belonged to a prominent Jewish family with some royal connections. He was in his late teens, but due to a war in his country, where his country was invaded, he was taken into captivity to Babylon. And there he was submerged into a different culture and a new worldview without compromising his own. He had to learn that language and he had to learn that culture and he had to perform in it. The other character is Nebuchadnezzar. Now this man achieved a practical dictatorship over most of the civilized world of his era. He was the king of Babylon. He was the son of the mighty Nabopolassar, and he was a great military man. He was a politician, politician and a great architect. He also, as we mentioned, conquered Israel, along with many other nations. And his kingdom, the Babylonian Empire, reached from Egypt to Mesopotamia, from modern-day Turkey to Saudi Arabia. And his capital, right in the middle, you can see, was Babylon. Now, Babylon was a city that for centuries and centuries, historian and archaeologists mocked. And mocked the Bible, that the Bible is fake, the Bible is not true. You know why? Because they could not find a city anywhere on the face of the earth, not even the remains that was called Babylon, until in 1920, not that long ago. Robert Caldway, who was an excavator, and he was walking around the area, and once he realized as he was walking that there were broken ceramic pieces, bright blue, and it was coming from towards one of these big hills. You see, in the Middle East, if a city gets deserted and there are sandstorms, the sand just covers over it over decades and centuries, and no one can tell that is it just a natural sand dune or underneath that sand dune, sand hill is actually some archeological effects, artifacts. So as he was following this path, they started digging, and to his greatest surprise, they found the city of Babylon. And so what's more, as they were digging, they got to a big piece, and as they were digging it out, it was the top of the Ishtar Gate, the main entrance to Babylon. And it was preserved amazingly. It was still covered with the blue ceramics that were bright as bright could be. So what he did with his colleagues, they pulled off these ceramic pieces one by one. They numbered the back of them. 
They put them in crates that was filled with hay. They shipped them back to Germany. And in Germany, they started a project. This is during the excavation. But in Germany, they started a project where they started piecing this gate together. It was a mammoth effort. And although they could put a lot together, if you go to the museum, you, st you still see hundreds and thousands of crates that haven't even been touched. And as a result, there is one of the crates. They put together these amazing murals that were originally from Babylon. And it is portraying the winged lion that was the symbol of the Babylonian empire. This is the Ishtar Gate. There were four to five gates that as you entered uh, Babylon, you walked through. And this was one of those gates. And they pieced them together. And a couple of years ago, I had the opportunity to actually go there and walk under the same gate that Daniel walked under when he was taken to captivity. If you ever travel to Europe, I urge you to make sure you to go Berlin because this is where history, Bible, actually comes true, comes alive. Now, the city of Babylon was a magnificent city. As I said, Nebuchadnezzar was a great architect. He wanted to make sure that this city would never be conquered. And to make sure, he built these massive walls over 90 meters tall. They had about 250 towers along those walls. And the walls were so thick on the top, so wide, that they could actually fit three chariots side by side and ride them on the top of the walls. Do you know what this picture represents? I can see some nods. It is the Hanging Garden of Babylon, one of the seven wonders. Nebuchadnezzar built that. Well, this is an, uh, an artist's impression. And he built it especially for his wife, his Persian wife. You see, Babylon was on the plains, but his Persian wife was coming from the hill country, and he, she was homesick for the hills. So he built this one for her so that it could remind her of the Persian hills. As I said, he was an architect. I never heard of the way he actually designed that his palace would be fully air-conditioned two and a half thousand years ago. And as they were digging out, they found all these clay cylinders and, and clay tablets. And they learned a lot about the Babylonian culture. And they found that almost every form of art had its beginning in Babylon. Let me give you a few examples of how their science was actually uh, so sophisticated. You know how we count, you know, one hour has 60 minutes and 60 seconds, each minute has 60 seconds. It was invented by the Babylonians two and a half thousand years ago. They distinguished five planets from all the stars. They were the ones who divided the year into 365 and a half days. They invented the zodiac and the sundial, and there's so many things we could mention. But we can come to the conclusion that Babylon was truly a mighty city in its golden era. Not just architecturally, but the intellectual properties were also astounding. But in this prophecy, Nebuchadnezzar and before that a little bit, and Daniel's life collide. It's when he invaded Israel, he decided to take captives, and he chose Daniel as some of his friends to take them to captivity. As I mentioned, Daniel received exten extensive education in Babylon about the culture, the worldview, and that actually enabled Daniel to be appointed to the royal staff. Not long after he was taken into captivity, a few years later, one day the king had an unusual experience. He had a dream which seemed to contain some evil omens, 
So let's pick up the story from Daniel chapter 2. Again, if you have a Bible with you, please open it with me. Today I'm using a New Living Translation. However, if you don't have a Bible at hand, I'll have all the text up on the screen. So Daniel chapter 2 and verse 2. One night, during the second year of his reign, Nebuchadnezzar had such disturbing dreams that he couldn't sleep. He called in his magicians, enchanters, sorcerers, and astrologers, and he demanded that they tell him what he had dreamed. As they stood before the king, he said, I have had a dream that deeply troubles me, and I must know what it means. Then the astrologers answered the king in Aramaic, Long live the king. Tell us the dream, and we will tell you what it means. But the king said to the astrologers, I am serious about this. If you don't tell me what my dream was and what it means, you will be torn limb for limb, and your houses will be turned into heaps of rubble. But if you tell me what I dreamed and what the dream means, I'll give you many wonderful gifts and honors. Just tell me the dream and what it means. Now, let's stop here. The king either forgotten his dream or he was testing his wise men and his magicians and astrologers if they were as wise as they said they were. So they continued to bug the king with the questions. Tell me what I saw and give me the meaning. And the astrologers were stunned, impossible, unreasonable, they protested. Let the king tell his servants the dream and we will give its interpretation. Now, the magician and astrologers tried over and over again, but he wouldn't disclose his dream. See, the Babylonian wise men claimed to have supernatural insight into the unknown, and they have failed their king miserably. They pressured him so much that at the end, the king says in verse 12, the king was furious when he heard this, and he ordered that all the wise men of Babylon be executed. And because of the king's decree, men were sent to find and kill Daniel and his friends. You see, Daniel and his friends fell in this category that were about to be executed. Let's see what Daniel does when he finds out that his life and his friend's life are at danger. Verse 14. When Ariok, the commander of the king's guard, came to kill them, Daniel handled the situation with wisdom and discretion. He asked Ariok, why has the king issued such a harsh decree? So Ariok told him all that happened. And Daniel went at once to see the king and requested more time to tell the king what the dream meant. I like that. Don't you? He went straight to the king. First, he finds out the whole picture. Not just the decree. Hey, tell me what's behind it. He gets the information. He gets the picture and makes the decision to go to the king. No hesitation. No panic. Just imagine if they say, we we'll come to execute you. No hesitation, no panic, just clear, wise thinking. When he got to the king, he asked for time. And when he was given the time, he went back home to his friends. Now, he didn't start speculating with his friends. He didn't come up with an escape route. Let's get out of Babylon. If we have to die, might as well die by escaping. Or they didn't curl up in the corner and started crying. They did something entirely different. Let's read verse 17. Then Daniel went home and told his friends, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, what had happened. He urged them to ask the God of heaven to show them his mercy by telling them the secret so they would not be executed along with the other wise men of Babylon. 
What did they do? They prayed. That's right. They went to the one. They went to the only one, the God of the universe who knows everything, including the king's dream. Their lives depended on an answer to this prayer. And that night, in verse 19, it says, the secret was revealed to Daniel in a vision. Then Daniel praised the God of heaven. Now, I don't know what you would have done if you got a vision. I think if I received the vision, I would have run to the king, even if I had to wake him up in the middle of the night. But you know what he does? And he talks about his wisdom. A man in his late teens, early 20s, he actually, in verses 20 to 23, they pray together and they give their praise to the God of the universe. He had his priorities right. Now let's see how the story unfolds from verse 24. Then Daniel went in to see Arioch, whom the king had ordered to execute the wise men of Babylon. And Daniel said to him, please don't kill the wise men. Take me to the king and I will tell him the meaning of his dream. Arioch quickly took Daniel to the king and said, I have found one of the captives from Judah who will tell the king the meaning of his dream. The king said to Daniel, is it true? Can you tell me what my dream was and what it means? Now, how would you have answered if you were Daniel? Would you have said, yes, of course I can tell you. I ask you to give me time, your majesty, and I have the answer for you. That would be a human, selfish way of answering, but see how he answered the question. Daniel replied, there are no wise men, enchanters, magicians, or fortune tellers who can reveal the king's secret. But there is a God in heaven who reveals secrets, and he has shown King Nebuchadnezzar what will happen in the future. Now I will tell you the dream and the visions you saw as you lay on your bed. What an amazing testimony. He's telling no wise men, and he was among those people. He said, no one can do it, but only God can do it. Verse 29, while your majesty was sleeping, you dreamed about coming events. He who reveals secrets has shown you what is going to happen. And it is not because I am wiser than anyone else that I know the secret of your dream, but because God wants you to understand what is in your heart. Daniel gives credit again to God and honor to the one who not only revealed the dream, but interpreted it. So here comes the dream. In your vision, your majesty, you saw standing before you a huge shining statue of man. It was frightening sight. The head of the statue was made of fine gold. Its chest and arms were silver. Its belly and thighs were bronze. Its legs were iron and its feet were a combination of iron and baked clay. As you watched, the rock was cut from a mountain, but not by human hands. It struck the feet of iron and clay, smashing them to bits. The whole stone was crushed into small pieces of iron, clay, bronze, silver, and gold. Then the wind blew them away without a trace, like chaff on the threshing floor. But the rock that knocked the statue down became a great mountain that covered the whole earth. This is the vision, the dream that Nebuchadnezzar received. And Daniel recited it, not because of his wisdom, but because of what God revealed to him. And then Daniel straight launches into the interpretation. I wish I could have seen Nebuchadnezzar's face when the dream was actually given to him. Then he says, that was the dream. Now we'll tell the king what it means, your majesty. You are the greatest of kings. I love Daniel. He knows what to say. You are the greatest of kings. The God of heaven has given you sovereignty, power, strength, and honor. 
He has made you the ruler over all the inhabited world and has put even the wild animals and birds under your control. You are the head of gold. Do you think Nebuchadnezzar liked that? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. But note how Daniel says, you were given these powers by God. He doesn't say, you achieved it, you developed it, so you were given. So we can establish that the gold head definitely is Babylon. And Babylon started at the Babylonian Empire in 605 BC, and it collapsed in 538 BC, and that's history. Then Daniel continues, but after your kingdom comes to an end, another kingdom inferior to yours will rise to take your place. After that kingdom has fallen, yet a third kingdom represented by bronze will rise to rule the world. Following that kingdom, there will be a fourth one, as strong as iron. That kingdom will smash and crush all previous empires, just as iron smashes and crushes everything it strikes. Daniel told Nebuchadnezzar that the silver chest, the bronze thighs, and the iron legs represented other kingdoms that came after him. Now, because we can look back in history on this prophecy, it's interesting to find out whether it was right or not. Babylon was taken over by the Medo-Persian. It was an amazing surprise to everybody that it happened. But when Medo-Persia took over, it actually lasted until 331 BC. And it was quite a big empire. And you can see where the capital Susa was, right in the center of it. And it actually lasted much longer than the Babylonian Empire. But then they were defeated by Alexander the Great. And he started the Greek Empire. And that was in place until 168 BC. And you can see that the Greek Empire was also a massive empire. And then came the Iron Legs. Rome took over the Greek Empire. And yes, it conquered much of the civilized world of that day. So, so far, if you go back in history, this prophecy is right. But the question is, what about the rest? It's not over yet. The feet and toes you saw were a combination of iron and baked clay showing that this kingdom will be divided. Like iron mixed with clay, it will have some of the strength of iron, but while some parts of it will be as strong as iron, other parts will be as weak as clay. This mixture of iron and clay also shows that these kingdoms will try to strengthen themselves by forming alliances with each other, but they will not hold together just as iron and clay do not mix. Now the feet of iron and clay pointed forward nearly 1,000 years from Daniel's time to the breakup of the Roman Empire. But when the Roman Empire broke up in about the fourth to the sixth centuries AD, that was when distant barbarian tribes overtook and overran the empire, and the descendants of these tribes became the nations of Europe. Now, you know Europe today. You hear about it every day in the news. What did Daniel predict about the future attempts to, to unite this divided nation, the United Nations? They will not hold together. Many attempts have been made throughout history to reunite the Roman Empire and to unite Europe again, only to fail. I would like to give you four examples today. The first one is this gentleman, 
Napoleon Bonaparte. He was a French military leader, also an emperor, who conquered much of Europe in the 1800s. He desperately wanted to conquer whole Europe, if not the whole world. But his ambition came to an end at the Battle of Waterloo in 1815. That's when his army faced the British and the Prussian armies. And the date marked the end of his reign because he lost the battle. This man's name is Kaiser Wilhelm II. He was Queen Victoria's first grandson. He was the King of Prussia and the Emperor of Germany from 1888 till 1918. Under his rule, Germany became a major economic and military power. And Kaiser was utterly convinced of his right to rule and his ambition was to make Germany a world power. Now, previously, a few decades earlier in the Franco-Prussian War, some parts of France, Metz, and the, and the county of Lorraine was annexed to the German Empire. And one day, when he visited the battlefields in 1915, he visited the Cathedral of Metz, it's in France today, but at that time belonged to the German Empire. And as he walked up to the cathedral, which is in a beautiful cathedral even today, at the entrance, you can see the four main prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, in a far right, you see Daniel. But when he walked up to it, he actually asked that the head of Daniel would be changed over to represent his likeness and his characteristics. And even if you go there today, you can see in the brochure where it says that the four main prophets and the latter ones still with the appearance of Emperor William II. He did that, and you know why? Because he knew and understand his prophecy and Daniel, and he wanted to prove Daniel wrong. He didn't succeed, did he? We all can recognize this man, Adolf Hitler, the Führer or leader of Germany from 1933 to 1945, and he was the one who orchestrated World War II. Historians are still divided as to his ultimate goals, some believing that it was limited to Nazi German domination over Europe. Others believe that this was just a springboard to ensure that he gains world domination. However, I found this article that was published in 1943 on May 8 in the Reich Minister of Propaganda which said, the Führer gave expression to his unshakable conviction that the Reich will be the master of all Europe. We shall yet have to engage in many fights, but these will undoubtedly lead to most wonderful victories. From there on, the way to world domination is practically certain. Whoever dominates Europe will thereby assume the leadership of the world. He didn't succeed, did he? But as we go closer, and the last example I would like to bring is the European Union. It was formed in 1993 on the 1st of November. It is a political and economic union of 27 member states that are located primary in Europe. But when I show you the map, you can actually see that not all the nations of Europe are in the European Union. Union. And just like Daniel too predicted, they do not hold together. I found it fascinating just a couple of weeks ago when, when there were some headlines that not all of the leaders of the member state agreed on a proposition. One nation vetoed it, and it brought the whole process to a standing 
Holt. And I just smiled, and I thought about this prophecy. They will not hold together, just as iron and clay do not mix. Don't you find it fascinating that it's actually playing out in front of our eyes? With this, we arrive to the present days in this prophecy. Two and a half thousand years fulfilled, and we can see that we are living, as Daryl said, in the torn nails or closer bed of that image. But the prophecy has one more element that is clearly going to happen in our future. Let's read from Daniel. As you watched, a rock was cut out from the mountain, but not by human hands. It struck the feet of iron and clay, smashing them to bits. And the whole statue was crushed into small pieces of iron, clay, bronze, silver, and gold. Then the wind blew them away without a trace, like chaff on a threshing floor. But the rock that knocked the statue down became a great mountain that covered the whole earth. And here comes Daniel's interpretation. During the reigns of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed or conquered. It will crush all these kingdoms into nothingness, and it will stand forever. That is the meaning of the rock cut from the mountain, though not by human hands that crushed the pieces of the statue of iron, bronze, clay, silver, and gold. The falling stone and the destruction of the image point to the end of the long human struggle to control the world. God's kingdom will rise from that chaos. And in that kingdom, it says he will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and there will be no more death or sorrow or crying or pain. All these things are gone forever. Ever. You know, I remember when I first heard this prophecy in a similar setting, just like you, Joy, in a public event, during a public evangelism, I was an atheist. I was brought up and taught against Christianity. I lived in a communist country. And when I heard this prophecy, I was absolutely blown away by the accuracy of its fulfillment. It gave me valid proof that God is real. He knows the future and he is all knowing. And bit by bit, it started to transform my atheist, non-God believing mind to actually accept God. First, only in my head, to know of him, to learn about him, to understand that he is there. And then the next step was to give my life to him, wanting to know him, wanting to follow him. And that is a decision and a journey I will never, ever regret in my life. And that's a journey that nobody can say that I have arrived, because that journey is taking me deeper and deeper and deeper. So you can see from this prophecy that God does see the future, and he reveals to us as much as we need to know. Yes, we would like to know a lot more, wouldn't we? We're curious, but he reveals enough. No second guesses, no facts mixed with speculation, no conspiracy theories, but truth only. Prophecies like this do not just give us intellectual secrets about the future and about the present, but it tells us that God is the God of the universe who will eventually save his people and give them the promised place in his kingdom that will be ruled by love and peace, not like here, by fear. So there are the short overrun of the prophecy and what prophecies mean. 
The purpose of the Bible and the prophecies within is not simply that we might be impressed with its astonishing accuracy of fulfillment. It is to lead us to Jesus Christ, to put our hope and our lives in his hand. And while we live, continue to live in this world with all its chaos, with all its crumbling environment, nuclear threat, collapsing economies, crimes, tsunamis, famine, overpopulation, etc., etc., let us heed Jesus' words. I have told you these things so that in may you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart. I have overcome the world. Can we hear it in this world? We will have trouble, but we can have peace that can only come from God. I believe that we can have certainty that our hope is built on Jesus Christ. Our hope is not only built on prophecies, but on the blood of Christ and his righteousness. We might be weak, but in him we are made strong. And through the storm, because there are lots of storms and more storms are going to come, through the storm, he is Lord, Lord of all. I would like to invite you if, whether it's the first time or whether you have made this commitment many times, that you accept him as your savior, that you want to stand by him in the midst of the storm and to receive that peace, please stand as we sing our final song, Cornerstone.